Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for this deep dive discussion. Uh, my name is John, and I'm here with Pastor Sean Scarborough. He's a lead pastor of Family Worship Center in Lakeland, Florida. Our goal for these conversations is to dig deeper into the gospel of God. As uh, we unpack some key points from Pastor Sean's Sunday messages, we hope this will be a catalyst for discipleship in your life and hopefully lead to more conversations with your family and friends in small groups. Um, so we just wrapped up a series on the return of Jesus and um, we'll be recapping the last three weeks. And by recapping, we mean covering about 1%. <laughs> yeah, right. So be sure to catch up on those messages. Also, a lot weaved in there. We, had, we celebrated our graduates. There was Mother's Day and Day of Pentecost. So we might have all kinds of subjects uh, today as we talk through. Um, so Pastor Son, week one or week, the first Whichever week we're covering, week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said something. You said when you do what the gospel says, yeah. at the end, the gospel wins. For sure. And um, you had this word of encouragement to our graduates as they get ready to kind of head into this season of life. Um, and you kind of said, hey, when you do the right things at first and you keep doing the right things, at first it might not seem like it's working. Yeah. But eventually it's going to work out. Yeah. Um, and then in the same way... If you start doing the wrong things, going against the gospel, it might actually not seem to crash and burn at first, yeah. but eventually it's going to lead to death. We have this word in the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4, it says, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. And then it goes on in verse 18 to say, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Yeah. So maybe talk about some of this, maybe from your own life, from things you just see in pastoring people, um, how it, it can be discouraging at first when it seems like you're doing the right thing over and over, but it's not working out. And then someone else over here, they're just ignoring the gospel, living just like the devil. And it's yeah. like, wow, there's, seems like you're doing pretty well. Yeah. What are some of those things that might, might, you know, come up in our minds and in our life? Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, talked about marriage, talked about finances. I think both of those are fantastic spaces. Um, when you're looking for, if you're a female and you're looking for a male who they love Jesus, they demonstrate leadership. There's somebody that you could actually, um, follow in their, in your household. Um, that's a different person than somebody that might just be, funny or just be attractive, you need to be attracted to them. If you like wit, they, you know, you, you need to find somebody witty, but greater than that, the higher standard is, is the gospel, what the gospel calls a husband to be. And so you can say this person doesn't fit these categories. They fit these and you might be able to get into a relationship sooner. Like they're available right now. And so same with, with guys and gals, um, the, the guy could be looking for somebody and there might be plenty of girls that fit this description, but to hold out for someone who puts Jesus first in their lives, um, cause if somebody doesn't follow Jesus, they're not going to follow you. Right. right. So at the end of the day, we can just jump into relationships because they're available and they're a lot of fun. And then three months later, the relationship is getting, um, closer and now you're having to consider marriage and is this the right person? And it looked great for three months, but if they're not the right person, the breakup can just be tumultuous. It can be emotional. Anyhow, all the above. So yeah, it looked great up front, but he or she wasn't the right person along the way. Finances. I mean, I want this. I want it now. I have a $5,000 credit limit. I'll take it. You're driving it. You're wearing it. Easy win. Everybody thinks you look great. Whatever. Two months later, you're still paying it. The interest is mounting. You're not winning. Um, so, yeah, when you look at what the gospel promises, it doesn't promise. It doesn't promise the win overnight. I mean, this is David. He's out in the field lamenting. He was anointed to be king, and he's saying, "Look at my enemies. They're prospering." When am I going to receive the thing that you anointed me to receive? So what was he, 14 years or something like that, waiting to be crowned king? That's a long time. Yeah, um, and you see different ones just take that leadership or take the crown and it doesn't end up so well. So, um, yeah, I think we could probably delve into any one of those spaces yeah. with 100 different stories. Um, 
dumb story, but uh, you know, I remember when I was first learning to play the drums. I think we could say this in most things that, that require mechanics. And I did not enjoy doing rudiments. And you had to learn to do, and there were guys that skipped rudiments. They just, oh, I'm gonna learn to play this song. And they learned to play this song and it sounded great. And I couldn't play that song. Yeah. But I was learning my rudiments. We might have to explain what rudiments are. Okay, so yeah, it's where you're actually having to um, learn a particular way to hold your drumstick. You're learning a particular beat with the drumsticks. And it's, it's building up speed in your wrist and also allows dexterity and all the above. And these kids are just like playing with their elbows, not with their wrists. So rudiments make you play with your wrist. You can play the easiest of songs with your elbows. But then, six months later, you can't play a harder song. Mm -hmm. So for those of us that learned our rudiments, we were much better drummers a year later. We learned how to read music. We learned how, And so now, three years later, four years later, they're still exactly where they were a year ago, yeah. playing the same three songs where we could move on. And I think in society today, we're skipping the fundamentals. And the gospel has fundamentals, and eventually those fundamentals win, but it's not always overnight. Yeah. It's usually not overnight. Yeah. So when I say the gospel wins every time, the gospel wins eventually every time. Amen. No, that's yeah. good. That's a great reminder. Um, yeah, I think on the flip side, if, if I was going to speak to the negative, um, you know, people that I've seen in my own life, those friends that were once connected to the local church, yep. um, and you see them kind of drift away from the body of Christ and, and being in the word and hearing the word. Um, at first, right, it's not like, oh, I, I skipped a month of, of church yeah. and now my life's wrecked. But five months, eight months, two years, and then you see them again and it's like, whoa. Yeah. Like what, yeah. what happened? And um, so, again, we you know, we might stop doing the, the, the rudimental or the elementary things yeah. and it, it immediately you don't see that effect, but it does add up in the end on the negative as well. For so, sure. Um, so both sides. Um, <clears throat> so you got into um, this part of Revelation where we see um, there is, so the rapture has happened yep. and there are 144,000 Jews um, that are described as the first fruits yep. um, that are marked and um, we see this pattern in, um, in Scripture, like in Romans 116, um, we see that salvation is to the Jew first and yep. then the Gentile. Um, and then also in Romans, I want to say, I didn't write the chapter down, Romans chapter 2 or 3, um, the Apostle Paul says, he says, There will be a tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first, and also the Greek. Yep. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But then he says this, for God shows no partiality. Yep. So this concept, as we're talking about our, our love and our um, respect and honor for the Jewish nation, sure. um, which clearly God chose them as a chosen people yeah. to bring forth the gospel. Um, I think in our society, it can get um, mixed up because we, we kind of live in this like, you know, like there is no, there is no order. It's yeah. just like everybody has a fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in, even in this text, it kind of seems almost contradic contradictory. He says the Jew first and also the Greek, but then he says, for God shows no partiality. Yep. So what is a healthy way of viewing um, our soteriology, uh, in, which includes the Jew first and then the Gentiles, but not um, in a way that, you know, falsely elevates the Jewish, I guess, race, so to speak, yeah. um, in a way that it seems as if we're saying, like, no, God shows partiality. Yeah. Um, what's, a, what's a healthy way of looking at that? Yeah, I think it's the more practical way. There's no partiality. What the scripture is saying is there's no partiality. If you do good, then you're going to be rewarded, the Jew first and also the Gentile. If you do evil, you're going to be punished, the Jew first and then the Gentile. So it's everybody who does evil will be punished. God is not partial. Everyone who does good will be rewarded. God is not partial. So th that's a true statement. Then when you're handing out rewards, it's also true that there's, a, there's sort of an, an order. I yeah. mean, I think we all understand that. If a waiter or waitress comes to the table, 
he or she has every meal on that, on that um, platter. But somebody's going to have the plate set down first. Now, that doesn't mean anybody's neglected. It just means somebody had their plate set down first. So for me, when I read this, it's the practicality of something being given to someone in the next and the next and the next. Yeah. Somebody's first. So if we want to say, okay, this is making this person seem like they are better than the rest of us, the responsibility is just as true on the other side. The Jew first, they're not only the first to receive the gospel, but it says whoever does evil will be repaid. The Jew first and also the Gentile. So there's no, there is no partiality, but at the same time, these gifts or giftedness or rewards have to be passed out. So to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus had the same conversation with his with his disciples, he's when the, the lady was coming to the table who wanted to pray for his daughter. Mm-hmm. And he said, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wasn't that he wasn't sent to the world. He was. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it wasn't that Jesus wasn't sent to the world, but he was sent to the Jew first. Um, but eventually, the Greeks also got the gospel. Yeah. So uh, there's no partiality, but there is order. Yeah, that's and, good. And I think order is a... I think we understand that for sure. Practically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the light turns green. Somebody's got to go first. Yeah. We all get the green light, but whoever was up front went through it first. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's helpful. Um, so, uh, you talked about podcasts. Yeah. Um, this is technically a podcast. Hopefully, it's helpful. Uh, hopefully, we're not just um, giving empty phrases out here. Yep. Um, but um, you talked about how. People love to hear about personal health when it regards like their bodies, their physical bodies, maybe their mental health. Um, you know, they'll have experts come on and talk about um, how you can better yourself physically, um, do a cold plunge, you know, eat this diet, eat that diet. And people don't get offended. Like sure. somebody that is living unhealthy, it's not like, oh, I can't believe you would tell me to live this way. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to spirituality and um, the gospel, you know, people get so offended if you tell them how to live a certain way. And it just practically, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's because we know there's a resistance to the gospel. There's a, there's a spiritual reason. But logically, it doesn't make sense. Um, but you talked about how we should be more vocal mm-hmm. about the gospel. It, it, it seems to be that the voices that are speaking out in regard to our spiritual health always seem to be silenced or always have a tendency to be quieter. And so I just wonder, um, in our own lives, in what ways do you see the church needing to be more vocal um, is it in our conversations with our family, with our friends? Is it what we post on social media? Um, is it just from the pulpit? Is it just in our small groups? Is it just as a whole, um, you know, practically when, when, when you preach that? Obviously, you mean every person because you preached it on a, on a Sunday. Yeah. So in our own lives, how can we be more vocal about the gospel um, in a way that um, is making a difference? Yeah. So we'll start with the person that posts a lot. Um, you know, there are a lot of people don't post. There are a lot of people that are not on social media. It's just not their thing. But let's take the person that posts when they're at a restaurant or when they are wherever. They're taking their kids to a baseball game and, you know, selfies of the family in the car or whatever. If that's your sort of func- – if you do that, if that's your function, you, you do a lot of that kind of stuff, where is the post on your way to church on Wednesday night? on your way to small group, on your way to Sunday morning. That's a fam. I mean, the most important thing we can do with our, the most important thing we can do with our family is load them in the car and take them to church on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Like that is the, or if you're a Saturday night person, Sunday night person, whatever, but you, that's your, that is a family thing. If you post important family things, but you don't post that, then there's a reason that you're not doing that, right? And it could be, that you do not want some of the fallout or resistance from friends because, oh, that's a Jesus freak or they're a religious family or they're whatever word you might put in a negative context about that person. So if we're going to be, oh, I'm taking the time to make this dinner for my family tonight and the people watching it, that doesn't make them feel like, oh, I'm lazy. I didn't cook for my family tonight. Um, 
if we're, if we're not afraid of offending on the other good things that we do, why aren't we including the things that we do spiritually that are good? Yeah. So I'm not, by, by any means, I'm not suggesting you, you know, you just go into some diatribe on your social posts with, hey, I just want you all to know I'm a Christian and I think you all ought to go out and get saved and if not, you're going to hell. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Um, but if you are somebody who's always telling people what to do, because there are those who they just like making, you know, they put themselves out there and this is what you need to be doing today. This is what I'm doing today. Then they should include spiritually what they're doing as well. So I'm saying what the things that are spiritual that are in your natural rhythm, if you post the other stuff, why don't we post this stuff? If we sit down and have conversations with friends about their finances, for instance, if I'm just sitting at a table and somebody wants to talk money or whatever, do I talk about tithing? Do I say, well, let me, we can talk about all that, but let me just tell you the very first thing that I do with every $10 that I make is a dollar goes straight to God. Yeah. And so now I just need you to understand that's where the blessing begins. And now let's talk about how we handle the other stuff. If I'm talking about the other 90%, why don't I talk about the 10%? So I'm just saying every area where you are following God, why don't we include that in that natural conversation? Uh, because I think it helps people. Yeah. Oh, I know it helps people. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just we're not even saying go out and start another conversation. Nope. Just bring it into the conversation you're already having. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's Absolutely. Great. That's great. Um, I think that comparison you're making, you're saying, if you're already doing this, why don't you do this? I think it translates to so many areas, even in our, um, in our worship of God, um, you know, people will say, well, I'm just, I'm just an introvert. Like, this Mm -hmm. is just who I am. All right. I'm, it's like, I'm fine with that. As long as if I follow you to a concert or a show or a, you know, Super Bowl party that you are the same expressive, yeah. passionate level there yeah. as when you worship God because you don't make you don't make the excuse there that you're an introvert or you might not. Um, so it's got to be, we've got to really make sure we're not being compartmentalizing our life. For sure. Um, in that way, our spiritual lives. So that's good. Um, so um, the 144,000 were marked. They were sealed. Mm-hmm. And in the same way he talked about in Ephesians chapter 1, that we have been sealed. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So um, obviously it's like, I don't, I don't fully think I even know what that means fully. Mm-hmm. And you talked about it a little bit on Sunday, but maybe, maybe talk about that a little bit more. How are we marked? How are we sealed? What are we sealed for? Yeah. Well, the marking or the sealing, I think let's use the word to mean the same thing. Because there are some, some persuasions that will say you are sealed as in locked or closed. There are others who say you are sealed as in marked. So it's a seal on you, Mm -hmm. like a brand. Um, And it seems like throughout the the text, the rest of the gospel, the the marking or the sealing is more like a a branding that you're labeled as his. Uh, Is that label what you call yourself? Is that label what others call you? Is that label what God calls you? Yes. It's like, it's it's all the above. Um, So when we are marked or sealed with the Holy Spirit, there is a, it's evident. It's evident whose we are. So what is that marking? In the Christian's life, it's obviously the fruit of the Spirit. We demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, and that labels us. Oh, they're a Christian, right? (laughs) It's in the same way that Jesus would say, you're mine. So there is that conversation of marking and sealing what what that means. Um, so that's how I take it. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, no, it's helpful. You know, absolutely. You, um, yeah, for me, that's that's how I see it to be. I think the the illustrations and the metaphors on sealing being like you're an envelope, and God puts the Holy Spirit in the envelope, and then He seals it, and it can't be opened. Um, I th- it seems like that 
illustration disregards the apostate church that once was in and then was out. Yeah. It disregards um, Judas, who was obviously used in one of the 70 who went out and healed the sick and, and then turns around, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. Like, you know, it disregards all of that. Uh, was Judas, was he considered a disciple of Jesus? That's the question. Was he yeah. with them? Yes. The 12, they were constantly called the 12. And then we see him, um, we see him walk away from that. We talked about that even when we were, I think when we were on that, maybe it was somewhere else. But you look at the 12 tribes of Israel mm-hmm. that were given land in um, the book of Numbers. And then you turn around and look at the ones labeled in Revelation with the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes to get 144,000. They're different names. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> what? Well, he, you know. Hebrews, it disregards, it would disregard Hebrews. It, yes. Um, of, you know, encouraging one another daily so that, you know, you aren't deceived by sin. Absolutely. You, you fail to receive. Like this says, who is the guarantee of the inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Yep. Hebrews says, so that you don't fail to receive mm-hmm. that promise, you mm-hmm. know. So, um, so I don't like the seal as an envelope. Right. I, I like it more of the, the label that is given you yeah. as a Christian. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That makes sense. Um, so deception is increasing. No surprise. Mm. Um, and you talked about how there is this going to be this day, and I believe it was Revelation chapter 20, um, where the devil is going to be de- thrown into this yeah. dark pit. Yeah. Um, but that day hasn't happened yet. And the same devil, the same Antichrist, uh, that same spirit is that then is going to deceive is already deceiving now. Sure. And um and he's already at work. He's he's prowling the the earth like a roaring lion, looking for who may he might devour. Um, the devil is at work. Um, he's whispering. You said he he whispers to our mind. You talked. You use Job as an example. Ezekiel, I think, as well. Um, just the devil coming yeah. and, and tempting. Um. What does that look like practically? Um, because we obviously need to be on guard. We're told to be on guard. Yeah. Like every follower of Jesus should be on guard against the enemy of our souls. But also, we, we, I wonder if we get distracted sometimes by things that aren't the devil, and then we allow things that are the devil to just hang out. Sure. So what, where do you see that, whether it would be in your own journey, your own walk in, in with the Lord, um, or you see in other people's lives, like they'll they'll be you know praying against the devil here, but then it seems like they're completely oblivious to the work of the enemy in their lives. Yeah, yeah, we all have we all have blind spots, mm-hmm. right? So if we the first part of correcting a blind spot, one is recognizing that it can exist for sure, but then it's also realizing where what are the things that. Like, is it even, is it even possible for the devil to deceive me? Like if I can have blind spots and is he out there doing this, then now I'm trying to look at the intersection of, all right, I realize I can have a blind spot and I agree fully that the devil is active. There are some people who really do not believe in the activity of the devil. They don't think that he's out there seeking to deceive them. In their minds, everything is kind of an equal opportunity. Uh, but it's, it's not, there are good opportunities. There are bad opportunities. So if I know he's active and I know I have blind spots, then I can begin to look at each individual major interaction or at least, um, an interaction that, that has, that has weight to it. So if I, if I recognize in me that when I'm bored, so I have nothing to do, um, I might sit down and begin channel surfing it. If I don't have anything pressing and I'm just channel surfing, now I have the opportunity to stop on something that may not be best for my contemplation or my meditation. Yeah. So I'm going to watch something for an hour or an hour and a half and then turn it off and walk away. Most of us, whether that affects daydreaming, whether that affects what we hope for, our visions, our dreams, or like whatever... Um, Putting an hour and a half of whatever that is will affect my creativity. Absolutely. So what was that hour and a half that I just watched? Um, if that I know is a space in my life that can 
lead me to vain imaginations or whatever, I have to be very careful about how much of whatever I watch. Is it, is it a total prohibition? Is it a, this isn't just entertainment, this is bad for me? Or is this entertainment, but I can't get too into this or I'm not going to devote the time I need to devote to my family or to my spouse or to my job or whatever. So for me, boredom is sort of an issue. So I developed years and years ago, um, rather than just watching something or scrolling online, uh, I go for a walk because I can just go get in my head and daydream, but it's not based on anything necessarily that I just watched or saw. And usually there will be a greater spiritual component to it. And it's, probably pretty healthy for me too, walking instead of sitting. Um, So that was a big one for me. The other thing for me is uh, music. I listened to hour upon hour upon hour. So my commute to school was about 20, 25 minutes. My commute to work was 40 minutes once I left school every single day. So, and then back home, you know, another 20 ish. So I was hour and a half in the car every day, no matter what, from the time I could drive. That's a lot of music every day of my life. So I can listen to basically anything from the 90s. And if you just say a word, I can usually quote the rest of the song just because I filled myself up with it. Now, that's not a great meditation. I don't, I didn't listen to great music lyrically. Um, so I have to be very careful where I am and what I listen to because if I hear something that triggers a song from 30 years ago, I'll be humming and singing that. I'll be meditating on that song for the next day. It's not always good. So for me, I kind of have to prohibit in my life listening to music that has language or, or uh, messaging that's not good mm-hmm. because I just notice it'll make me either a little more irritable or it'll make me a little more, you know, I, I'm a little on the, I have a high rebellion quotient. It's just natural for me. Um, there are some people, my wife, she was born good. I really have to work at being decent. So if I'm meditating on something that is just kind of waking up that wild side, that is, it's not good. Mm-hmm. So for me, yeah, those are, the devil's always lurking. I know he's always lurking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. Um, so He's not, he's not completely, well, how did you word it? He's not, he's been defeated, but he hasn't. Like he's, yeah. we're, we're still in that in-between, I think you described it as. Um, well, we read it. He's, he's going to be chained up and thrown in a pit. Yeah. So is he defeated? Yes. If you look at the whole game, like we're, we'll call that, well, we'll call that moment, we might as well call it the end. He gets released again, and then he gets you know, at the end of the thousand years. But let's just say when he gets locked up, we'll just kind of call that a, a almost a false summit. That's basically the end. So that he's defeated because the keys to death and hell Jesus has, yeah. right? He won those when he descended, but he didn't lock him up there. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus didn't lock Satan in hell where he can't deceive us. So when we say he's defeated, that's a future statement. Is he roaring today? Yes. Is he prowling around today? Yes. Do we have the power in us to overcome him? Yes. But if we don't use the power within us to say no, to resist the devil, then he doesn't flee. Yeah. There's no promise of a fleeing devil without resistance, spiritual resistance. So if I just say yes to him, His defeat doesn't actually matter because practically I'm losing Mm -hmm. because I let him in. So the idea that he's defeated and we don't need to be concerned with him, that's a false positive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Um, So kind of along this line of, you know, you you said there's people that, that, you know, the devil's not a concern for them. You know, Mm -hmm. the the devil's been defeated. What it is is it's they're taking a future moment and they're bringing it into the now, yeah. into this present moment, and that's that's doing them a disservice. In what other ways has the church maybe taken those promises which are to come, but brought them into our current time, and perhaps brought some confusion or br- some disappointment yeah. 
um, by taking taking a, a time that has not yet happened, bringing it into the current time. Um, and one thing I think of naturally is healing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we believe in healing. We believe that 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 Jesus heals. We've seen him heal. Um, but there is a there is a day where there will be no more weeping. Yeah. Um, he's going to wipe every tear from their eye, and it says sickness will be no more. Yeah. Um, but that's a day. Yeah. That is coming. So is that something that sometimes, if we're not careful, we can we can bring into kind of this present world as if you know um, every tear is going to be wiped away and sickness will be no more now. Yeah. Um, and how how can we live in that tension? Of the now again, it's the same. It really, yeah. it's the same tension yeah. Yeah. as the, as the yeah. devil because it's the yeah. now and not yet. Like he's been defeated. It's the same principle. Yeah, it's the same principle. Uh, I think that's why we have different movements, not necessarily denominations. Denominations are usually on a particular doctrine, yeah. typically related to our embrace of the way we see salvation, or or maybe even the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But movements that are sometimes even within denominations, I think that's what they struggle with. Um, it's this is how it's supposed to be always. So just speaking to um, like faith movements where you brought up healing. Um, it's this is God's will every single time. If you don't get healed, it's because you didn't have enough faith or somebody on the other side that's thinking, okay, well, they didn't get healed. So healing doesn't exist. That means salvation doesn't exist. So I'm done. Um, we don't sometimes when we have conversations, we we're scared to give okay, this might end badly. Like, it's not a great, it's not a good conversation. No one wants to hear it. But at the end of the day, do I believe God heals people? Yes. Have I seen people healed? Yes. I've also seen people not get healed and die. Is that possible? Yes. Does that mean they didn't have enough faith to be healed? No, it doesn't. Like, when we put that kind of a, like, like say we put it on a parent that if you have enough faith, your child will be healed. And then that child isn't healed. Um, that's, that's not even just bad doctrine. That is cruel. That it, I never, I don't ever see Jesus put that burden on people. Um, at the same time where there are moments, especially that we even brought up yesterday, he could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Do you have to believe to receive? Yes, you absolutely do. Um, does that mean every single person who believes receives? I would love to say it meant that, but, but experientially, I don't see that. Um, so yes, it's like we're trying to bring in that thousand years of there's, there's not death the way we see death. There isn't sickness the way we see sickness. It's, it's gone. And the scripture you're referring to is actually even after that when heaven and earth pass away and he brings a new heaven and a new earth. That's where every tear is wiped from their eyes. So there's still even disappointment at the conclusion of the thousand year reign. So, um, yeah, rambling a bit there, but yes, we can say, we can get into it and, and say, okay, God promised to bless us. Therefore we should have this measure of prosperity. But then you read two of the seven churches in the book of revelation and two of them were poor. And he said, your, your poverty is actually, um, it, it, it's not going to hurt you from doing the thing that I've called you to do, so just persevere. Okay. So what do we do with that? Yeah. I mean, there, there's, so many, there's so many examples where um, our, our ideas or our hopes don't play all the way through. Normative, generally speaking. Does God bless us? Yes. But what is blessing? Paul said, if you have food and clothing and something to, to live under, be content. So I think that must be the foundation of blessing. Yeah. But if I'm going to push that to mean trips to wherever I want to go and private jets and now blessing has to be that, well, nobody has that. So, or at least not a lot of people have that. Um, I think we have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's helpful. We have to be careful. Yeah, that's good. Um, so along those lines, uh, fortune, fame, uh, you know, you talked about how there was a church that can be deceived by um, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
even uh, miracles, mm-hmm. um, you know, the Antichrist will perform miracles. Absolutely. Um, and people will be deceived by that. Um, even today in, in our local setting um, or our local, uh, I don't want to say local, uh, our current time, um, you see people kind of following every wind of doctrine that comes forth, you know, because they're doing miracles, but the their actual doctrine what they're teaching is so far off from the gospel, Mm -hmm. but people get distracted with those things Um, and how we can even let that affect our, our politics in such a way that we um, will vote for, you know, we, we get attracted to people because of their success quote, their blessing quote, because of what we consider blessing. Um, And we will celebrate that in a God, almost in a gospel way. We'll celebrate. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, Rather than just, like, we realize that we have a civic duty to vote. Um, Jesus said, pay taxes to Caesar. He said, you know, whose face is on this, you know, then give to Caesar what Caesar's. He never said, let's celebrate Caesar. Let's promote Caesar in, in, a, in, a, in a gospel way. He just said, like, yeah, do your civil duty and pay your, pay your taxes to Caesar. So in the same way, we all, we're all going to have to vote, or we all should vote, yep. on in the upcoming election. But there's a difference between voting for somebody and celebrating them, exalting them, um, exalting a lifestyle that is clearly completely opposite to the gospel. Yeah. Um, where do we draw the line? At what point are we celebrating and at what point are we promoting or endorsing for the sake of a civic duty? Yeah. We are celebrating when we can't have a decent discussion with somebody that we disagree with. Like, I might have a disagreement about what color to paint the building, but if I hold to that as if I'm disagreeing on, is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Like, nothing in my thought process should bring out that level of passion other than Jesus Christ and His Word, period. So if we're talking politics... And the best way to handle infrastructure, taxes, whatever. We're not talking about morality. Let's ignore morality for a minute. We're just talking about what is the best way to build systems that move people from A to B and help people get jobs and the stuff that we would put on a political spectrum. Um, We should be able to have conversation about that. We should be able to have an opinion, an educated opinion about that. And we vote accordingly. Great. Um, Then if we want to talk morality, if somebody is politically standing for something morally that I agree with, but they're not living it. So what I've seen in my lifetime is when a pastor who's preaching the gospel, when they disqualify themselves from preaching the gospel because of immorality, The church is quick to say, okay, this leader is not demonstrating leadership, so I'm not following them anymore. We're quick to do that. On the political side of things, we call people moral who would put something moral on a ballot while they themselves are immoral, and we celebrate them as if they're doing a gospel function. That's conflicting because of their immoral lifestyle. Um, am I saying that we should not be excited and vote for people who, even though they're immoral, they stand for moral things? That's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, I, I vote for a lot of immoral people who stand for morality, Mm -hmm. but I don't celebrate them. Meaning I don't give them a pass on their immorality and act like, oh, this person is perfect. I recognize their life might be a train wreck, but because they stand for things, or at least they put on the ballot that they stand for things that are that I consider moral based on the foundation of the word of God, I'll vote for them, but I'm not going to lose friends over them yeah. be, because I don't understand why I would, I, I don't understand why I would elevate somebody. I don't know why any of us elevate somebody whose lifestyle is that immoral. Obviously I'm talking about Donald Trump, right? Like it's, it, it, why, who are we talking about? I mean, this happens all the time recently. It's kind of a modern, it's kind of a modern thing. Um, I mean, I haven't been around for a bunch of elections, but I've been involved in enough. 
And I can remember when there would be immorality in a, a candidate, for instance, like Bill Clinton, and it would be don't vote for him because of his immorality. Oh, okay, I thought we weren't voting for him because of his positions on abortion or his, his I think that was usually the main thing back, back in the day. Um, I thought that was why we didn't, but I didn't think it was because he was immoral. But then if we take the same church people who 30 years ago said, don't vote for him because he's immoral, not because of the abortion issue, bring it forward now. And they are like, you vote for Trump because, well, wait, I thought I didn't vote for immoral people. So we ha we're obviously, we did the same thing, by the way, on the Republican side, we did the same thing with Mitt Romney. Um, Mormonism is a cult. We've always recognized it as Christianity has always recognized Mormonism as a cult. But when Mitt Romney was running for office, suddenly the church world became very comfortable calling Romney a Christian. We never recognized Mormonism as Christianity prior to, but we needed to sort of um, sanctify him so that we could vote for him. We've been doing this. It's just worse today than it's ever been. Yeah. Um, I think we have to be careful because that's what we see in the Antichrist is he is a political leader who clearly does not have the lifestyle to be platformed. However, he's going to say some right stuff that's going to deceive the world and we're going to elevate him. We're already seeing a measure of that with different leaders. Yeah. Um, it's just as bad with Joe Biden. I don't know why we're, I mean, I'm just picking on Donald Trump. Um, you, you know, Joe Biden might claim to be a Christian and he stands for, from my perspective, yeah. some of the most immoral positions I've ever seen a sitting president stand for. He doesn't even try to hide it. So do I think that Joe Biden is a Christian, even a Catholic Christian? Absolutely not. Right. Am I judging him? I, I don't feel like I am. I feel like I'm looking at a lifestyle. Is his lifestyle marked? His lifestyle is not marked. Was he, did he ride on a train to go raise his kids when he, at, when he lost his wife? Absolutely. Has he done some moral things in his life that are likable? Absolutely. When he's just sitting around eating ice cream, is he a likable guy? Maybe. But he stands for the highest levels of immorality that have ever been stood for. So no, I'm not going to vote for him. But the other guy's lifestyle is terrible also. So even if I vote for him, even when I vote for him, if there's nobody else that shows up, um, am I going to celebrate him? I'm, I'm not going to. Nope. Yeah, no, that's good. I thought you described both sides really well. And it makes you wonder if, if the church would have spent more time praying for a godly leader and less time complaining or, or less time celebrating a um, immoral leader how things would maybe potentially look different this election. Who knows? God only yeah. knows. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so here we are. Here we are. Yeah, here we are. Absolutely. <laughs> so everybody yeah. go vote. Still vote. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, cool deal. Well, let's finish up the conversation here. And um, th this last week you talked about um, the church in Ephesus. There's a letter to the church in Ephesus in Revelation um, talking about returning to those first works. Um, and am I, am I right on that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and returning to those first works and you said we had to go back to acts to see what those were. Basically it was, um, uh, them embracing the fullness of everything that God had for them. Yeah. Um, you talked about this gift that we have, the gift of, of tongues, um, uh, the gift of baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Um, that is for everyone. We believe yeah. that's for everyone. Yeah. There's um, three different kinds of tongues. Um, there's the uh, there's tongues where you're speaking an actual language that that people would understand here on earth, that like which actually happened in Acts two. Yeah. Uh, and then there's tongues. Um, that is that actual gift that somebody has by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit wills. That needs that would be interpreted by someone who has a gift of interpretation, and then the yep. third form of tongues would be that which is available to everyone, um, which would be not you, nobody would be able to understand. It's a it's a language. It's a spiritual language that every single person um, gets when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yep. <clears throat> and so, go back and listen to that message because there's nothing more to be said of of how the the. The Bible is clear about tongues. It's so clear. Um, so we're not going to talk about that. 
Um, but I, I think we can speak to maybe some things you didn't get to, yeah. um, which one would be, what are some misconceptions that frustrate you either from those outside the church or even those inside the church on either side of the gift, you know, their perspective of the gift of tongues? Um, what are some, some misconceptions that you personally as a pastor, you're like, oh, like, yeah. I, wish, I wish it wasn't portrayed in this way. Yeah, so you have a lot. Most denominations today are what we would call continuist. Um, so even even in um, Baptist camps or Reformed camps, churches that may not be as experiential, you know, as as other denominations or movements, even on that side, there are a lot of them who are continuist, and they would say, "Oh, yes, we believe in you know these nine gifts of the Spirit outlined in." Um, outlined in Corinthians 12. We also believe in those outlined in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Romans 12. Um, but specific to tongues, they would just say, it's not for me. It's, it's available, but it's not for me. It's available for those whom God has gifted because it's as he wills. And then they don't, they don't go on into 14 and see that there is the desire for everyone to be baptized with the Holy Spirit or to speak in tongues as a result of baptism, and they don't differentiate between the two. That frustrates me. And it doesn't frustrate me because um, it doesn't frustrate me because somebody does or doesn't speak in tongues. I mean, that's I, I feel like um, it's a great benefit to us. I, I feel like I'm like the Apostle Paul in that way. I wish everybody did. Uh, it, if they choose not to, or that they don't want to. Um, there are people who don't serve in their local church. That frustrates me. They have giftedness within them that they're not using in the body of Christ. That frustrates me. But the, what, what gets me probably the most about it is that they don't differentiate, mm-hmm. uh, that they're content to just say, God doesn't have this for me. Because I hear that a lot. You know, there will be people who can preach actually great sermons on tongues. And then they'll say, but I don't have that gift. Um, well, it's not that you don't have that gift you haven't desired or submitted to a moment to be baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We're not talking about a gift here. We're talking about this evidence. Now, is it a gift? Yes, it's a gift because it's a grace. Everything is a gift in that broad way. Mm -hmm. But speaking specifically, that really, that that bothers me. Uh, The other thing that would bother me is when people would say, it's just gibberish. No one knows what they're saying. Who cares? It it's true that the mind is unfruitful. That is how the gospel describes speaking in an unknown tongue, unknown to you, unknown to the hearer. Un- there's no interpreter. The mind is unfruitful. But we don't go on and see, yeah, but look at the benefit right. that you pray mysteries or that you build yourself up or that you give thanks well. I think if we would at least talk about the benefit more, not just A, B, I have it or I don't have it. If you talk about the benefit of something, I think more people want it. And as more people desire something from heaven, God will bestow. God will yeah, move. Absolutely. So to that point, um, what would you say to the person who desires to speak in tongues, um, to, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but they haven't seemed to have received yeah. that yet? Um, what would you say to that person? They've, they're, they're pursuing it. They've, they're pursuing those opportunities. Um, and I'm sure you've already had this conversation with people before, so. Yeah, I, I, it's two things. One is patience. Uh, when Jesus, the first time that he sent them to go and wait to receive the baptism, it took them 10 days. That's a long time. Yeah. Um, I think that's a long time. We'll have people come sort of, you know, they might wait on God three minutes at their bedside, nothing happens, they go back to bed, whatever. Um, I, it seems like you have to be patient, but the other thing it seems like is what is feeding your desire? So if it's just something we have a conversation about once a year and that's it, and we don't really go on, we're not, we're not awakening an appetite for something. If we're always listening to people who are complaining about speaking in tongues or they're saying it's a it's a gift, but it's not for you. There will always be that sort of hesitation in us to not necessarily desire to receive this from God. I do think we sometimes use that as an excuse. At the end of the day, 
there is an awkwardness to the sound of tongues. Yeah. And I'm not sure people that say, oh, I want that, actually really want that. And they can almost use not receiving as an excuse to not want. Right. And if you really want the baptism, there's nothing in the word that would lead me to believe that God will not give it to you. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're not receiving, maybe work on what you're hearing that, that can mature your desire, Mm -hmm. that can wake up that desire and, and, and be persistent. Yeah. Like you see this, this, the, the lady, Jesus told the story, the lady that desired vengeance, and she kept going to the judge. The judge, she kept asking, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? And then Jesus says, if you know, this unjust judge gave her, how much more will the Father give? So I think we need to ask more than once a year. Yeah. Um, That's good. <laughs> you know? Agreed. Be persistent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then last thing, you know, not, we're not making any excuses, but for those that are desiring it, yeah. um, are we right in saying that there shouldn't be any kind of feeling of inferior, inferiority, inferiority, I can't say that word, um, in regard to our standing with God um, in, in relation to those who do pr- have, have prayed in tongues or praying yeah. in tongues, been baptized in the Holy Spirit? We're not, we're not making a distinction between um, our relationship with God, right? Right, um, and, right. And, and, you know, people shouldn't, shouldn't feel like, oh man, like I'm, I'm farther from God than somebody who yeah. um, prays in tongues. But I would think the right word is enhancement, right? Like it certainly enhances your relationship with God. Sure. Yeah. Every single, every grace we can receive from God is going to make life better. Right. Right. Does it make us more saved? No. Does it make us more loved by God? No. Does it make us closer to God? Where I would feel like I can say it can is is just in this way. As someone who prays with the Spirit, so you pray in other tongues, if you pray all of your mindedness, let's just put that in time. Okay, let's say that's 30 minutes. I can pray everything I need to ask for in 30 minutes. But if I pray now with the Spirit, I'm spending more time with God. Yeah. That more time with God, I would like to think, is a benefit in my relationship with God. So, does God love me more? No. Is it possible that I can know God more? Yes. Because I spend more time with Him. In the same way that the person, there are academics who read the Word. They know the Word. They don't spend time, though, with Him. It's just... It, it's like a, a mental exercise. Does the person know him more that five minutes in the morning from their heart desires to hear from God? Yes, they know him more. So I'm not, I'm not saying just time alone will do it. That's a, that's great but if you have the right heart right. and you have more time with him, that seems like you would know him more. Because yeah. you're giving him... Now this is something I didn't talk about, but when you're personally praying in the spirit, he said two things. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. It, if you look at what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 14, on the public front, he said, I want you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Why? Because he goes on and says, because when you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. But when you prophesy, everybody is, they understand. Well, I do think it's a good thing for there to be those moments in prayer, praying with the Spirit, where it does accelerate or mature to prophecy. Mm -hmm. Could you have gotten to that place in prayer where you're prophesying absent that time praying with the Spirit? Probably not. That doesn't mean I'm saying a hard no, because there are people who prophesy who do not pray with tongues. But as just a practical time with God, it seems like praying in tongues will get us to a spiritual place of hearing spiritual words that we speak out on the earth, which is what we would call prophecy. So enhancement almost understates it, but it doesn't make us any more loved by God. So we shouldn't be arrogant about it. Well, and I would even say praying in the spirit coupled with holiness 
because you could have somebody that doesn't pray in the spirit, but they're actually living a holy life sure. to God. Yeah. Well, they're, I mean, in, in, as far as effectiveness, that's going to be way more effective yeah. than someone who prays in the spirit, but is living like the devil, right? Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. <laughs> we can probably think of a lot of people that, that were baptized in the Holy Spirit, Absolutely. praying in tongues, and then it was like, whoa, yeah. what's going e- on? Every grace, right? Yeah. Like every grace is that way. There are yeah. people who they, they might sing well. Okay, great. You still have to walk by faith, meaning you have to live right. right. Like this, just because somebody prays in tongues is not a, you, you can suddenly not live right. right. And that's what I mean by your, your, you being with him, by grace are we saved through faith. That's a faith thing. Not I pray in tongues more or I prophesy more because that puts us, it does put us back into, which isn't that why chapter 13 is there Mm -hmm. from Corinthians 12 to 14? Like, even if I do all these things, but I don't love, it's a, it's a sounding symbol. It sounds like a gong. So yes, we always have to be careful that by receiving an enhancement, it doesn't give us the ability to now I can neglect things. We can't neglect. This is added to. It's not. An, it's not a replacement, yeah. and it's not a replacement for mindedness. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my mind also. We still have the command to ask for those things or pray through those things that we have knowledge to pray through. Yeah. And and like you know, I think spirit filled people can be lazy in their minded prayers because they just immediately start praying in tongues. I get it. But we do need to be intentional and specific. It matters. Yeah. So, yeah. That's good. That's really helpful. Anything else you want to add in the end of all this? No? No. I think all right. you've covered more than. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining us today for another deep dive. We do hope that this um, just stirred up your spirit and um, that it's encouraging to you. And, and hopefully you continue the conversation with others around you. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>